Ron, who is president of the Cypress Lakes Bonsai Society, which is the yeah, northerners. Way, way, way in the north side of town. But uh, I found out that Dave lives just around the lake here on East Easton. Easton and Cleveland, Cleveland Heights. Oh. And his yard is fabulous. Matter of fact, your dog is famous too. I got that out from my sorority sister. <laughs> uh, and back in uh, November, they did a program for our Camellia Society. And I asked, I said, have you ever done roses? Thinking of us here. And, well, yeah, sure. Why not? Uh, I also got a challenge for you, too, with Gisneriades. I brought the article on doing a bonsai for Gisneriades, so I got that for you. So that's another challenge. All right. Are you ready? Accepted. Challenge accepted. Okay. Well, if you're ready... Are we ready? Because this his program was so good in November for Cornelius. My husband's not here, so he say this. Bob didn't even fall asleep. <laughs> okay? And he kept talking about it all the way home, so I knew it was what he was real good. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. All right, folks, yeah, so I, Dave Clark and I do live just on the other side of the lake, and uh, I used to work here on campus uh, 25 years ago. I had a parking space right in front of the Army ROTC building. So I was just naturally driving up the road and just came back. Now the parking space is gone and something else. They've rearranged everything. Everything's been changed. The band shell that used to be next to the... Oh, wow. So a lot changes in 25 years. So, anyhow, yeah, so Bonsai. Uh, anybody got any familiarity with Bonsai at all other than... Other than the fact that I can kill one in three days. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's how you start. Water, too much water, not enough wine, yep. too yep. much wine. You're already well down the path then to play on Bonsai Master. Yeah. After World War II, but where uh, the last place my dad was stationed, was still Air Force Base. Our family yep. settled in Connecticut. Yep. At that Air Force Base in Madison. It's in Massachusetts. But my mom had char chartreuse. And, and deep magenta was the color. And on top of our little TV set in 1949 was this bonsai that my mother truly loved and awesome. nobody touched it. So that's awesome. anyway. And that's that's a, a really a lot of uh, American interest in bonsai kind of started after World War II with the GIs coming back and being exposed to all that in Asia. But you know, bonsai really goes back and it's kind of lost to history exactly where and when, but there's some pretty good record about 300 BC in China. Uh, they can see, you know, picture of paintings and all that have that on there. And so really up until about seven or 800 AD when it migrated from China to Japan, Japan took it in a little different level. And that's where the, the bonsai we think of today is really got Japanese roots that date back that far. So it goes back a long ways is the point. Uh, Europe kind of got it a taste of it in the early 1900s, and then the U.S. kind of got on the scene after World War II and that kind of thing. So now it's really kind of continuing to spread around the globe. I took a course uh, two weeks ago over at Artisan's Bonsai is in Tampa. It's a bonsai nursery, and I took a four-day class from a bonsai master from Brazil, and um, he teaches around the world and that kind of So it's really, it's a global, a global phenomenon, and there are specific techniques that have sort of popped up everywhere and we in Florida have kind of developed our own little thing with some of the tropicals that are local too so and I'm always looking for something that's I've never seen that bonsai before I wonder if you can uh, but that is a misperception I guess or misconception of bonsai that is a tree a bonsai is a bonsai tree and it's a specific variety or cultivar or something that is not true it really could be just about anything really a woody plant of some type um, and there are relatives to bonsai like Ikebana, which is Japanese flower arranging. Uh, there's Kusunomo, where they take grasses and orchids and can make accent plants for displays next to bonsai. I can make your eyes roll back in your head with all this kind of stuff. So the, I won't do it to you, not today. But so I think today what we'll do is I'll talk a little bit about the trees I've brought and I'll have the discussion. And I think uh, this is one we want to kind of do some little clipping on and see if we can begin it on his bonsai journey. So what I'll do is migrate to that, take a seat, continue talking while I start to do some wiring and some snipping and talk about the pruning techniques. Because really, that's what bonsai really is. It's just a pruning technique. 
period. That's all it is. It's trying to take a plant and give it a sense of character that puts you, if you're going to be traditional about it, into the landscape, into the, it reminds you of it. If it's an oak tree that you're swaying on as a kid, or it reminds you of a hillside that you saw when you're on vacation in Colorado, or you know, it takes you somewhere, it gives you a feeling. That's what bonsai is supposed to do. Oh, it's got twists and turns, just like in in art, where I guess you've got a Rembrandt that will paint something that looks very, and then you'll have a Picasso or a Dali, Salvador Dali, and they're like, that's all art, but they're not the same art, right? They're art in a different way. Then bonsai has a same too. There's there was a time where making the most grotesque, twisted, bent around, wrapped up, tied in a pretzel knot tree was, was bonsai. Um, but we've migrated back to trying to get more of a sense of a natural look, at least in a more traditional way. So uh, bonsai can range in size from very, very small. This would be called a mame size. It, uh, you, some people will take you know, souvenir thimbles, you know, you go on vacation, you have a thimble from everywhere, it's got a little, they'll turn it upside down, put little legs on it with some glue, and use those as pots. Or that's how small they put on the tip of your finger. Mame means bean in Japan. So they're very, very small. This is just a succulent in here, but this is a Fukian tea that's sitting in this little pot. The rooting. And um, this is just a ficus uh, tree in here. And these have probably been in this pot for five years now. <laughs> so the pruning, and this is a tababuya. Maybe you're familiar with the tababuya here in Lincoln. This is a yellow tababuya, and it's four years old. Wow. Yeah. Does it bloom? Uh, no, no, it does not bloom. No, not this. But I'm too busy trimming the back. I think. But I will tell you, this tababuya came from a seed pod. It was bored. It was COVID. I was bored. My neighbor had a beautiful tree across here. Took the seed pod, took out the little, you know, seeds, planted them in the tree, and they popped up everywhere, like they do in your yard and everywhere else you don't want them to. Well, I pulled them out. I call them the four sisters. This is the littlest of the four sisters. To keep it in the little pot. There's a bigger pot. She's bigger. And, it, and I got one uh, medium-sized sister comes up, dots your belly button in a bigger pot. And then one I planted in the yard, and I pruned it back. Number it is 20 feet tall, and it bloomed this year for the first time. First time I was expecting seven or eight years. We're only four years old. So same sisters from the same seed, same pod, but the technique of growing it has changed. So in bonsai, what we'll do is we'll do the pruning. I'm going to talk about in more detail, but that's the tough. But you also got to do root pruning. You got to balance the tree. Uh, and so periodically, in some cases every year, in some cases as the tree gets older and slows down, maybe once every five or ten years, you pull it out of the pot, you rake the soil away, you cut the roots in a particular fashion, and then repot it. So um, I've got some few hundred trees. I, I gotta be careful so my wife doesn't hear exactly the number. Around 400 or so. And so now I got about a hundred repots to do, and the window here is—you know—there's a window for it. That's ideal, as you probably know from your roses and all that. Which I love talking to groups like this because bonsai is a marriage of the horticultural piece of plant growing, tree growing, and the artistic side of pruning and shaping and visioning and making it do what you want. Those two have to marry up. And some people are very good on the horticultural side, but they don't are very artistic thinking or look right. And there's other people that are oh they're all artsy fartsy on this side. But they could they couldn't they couldn't grow a ivy plant or so they couldn't grow a weed, you know what I mean? <laughs> but you get those two together. The hardest part I think really is the horticultural part. The watering. I tell people, look, of everything I do, wiring, cutting, clipping, you know, harvesting from the wild, growing from seed, shaping, doing the hardest thing is watering, figuring out it changes all. How often do you water? Like, depends. You know, what's the tree doing? What time of year is it? You guys know all that. So that, <laughs> you're so far along in that regard. If you want to do some bonsai, you're you got the hard part done. So all right, those are the smallest ones there. The pots can be anything. I told you that you know, thimble. You can. Uh, this is actually a little metal cap that goes on the bottom of the leg of a chair. You know, put the nail through the bottom, and it has a little felt on the bottom thing, and keeps your chair. Uh, you can use your own imagination as you look around and see things that can become pots. What we really want in bonsai is good drainage. Um, so you got to make sure you got good drainage holes. This is a particular style of pot, and that's just the parsimony juniper in there. And I think I did also that during COVID. So it's around four or five years. Just a juniper you picked up at Lowe's or whatever, and then you, and then the dead wood features and things that you can add to the tree. We'll take 
People ask, well, how old is that tree? That's a common question. I want to know. Because there are trees out there. You ever been to the National Arboretum in, in Washington, D.C.? There's a bonsai section, and that's a, trees that were donated to the United States government from the government of Japan or China or Korea. And uh, some of those trees have been cultivate, cultivated by human hands for well over 100 years, 200 years in some cases. Even 200 years, a human being has tended to this tree. I'd be the one old, like, oh, it's my turn now. You know, I don't, you don't want to mess it up. But, but those are very old trees, just age wise. Well, in bonsai, there are te techniques we'll use where we can take a relatively young tree and give it the appearance of age. And we'll do that from you know, stripping off bark and giving it the, the rugged look that you would expect to see of a junipers, especially, and other pines. You know, they tend to live in places that subject them to the elements pretty much heavy snows high altitudes in the Colorado mountains, hanging on the side of a cliff by the ocean or something, and they get beat up by the sun and, and deer rub their antlers against them. All kinds of bad things happen to them. And if you're a bristlecone pine, and you've been around for 1,500 years, a lot of bad things have happened to you in centuries and centuries of being out there. So you can replicate that in a young tree to give it that feeling of age, and that's some of the things that we do in bones on. So, so that's just a little uh, juniper there. This one I brought. It was hard to go through the garden this morning and say, okay, which ones did I take? <laughs> and not to make a bunch of trips back and forth. I don't want to bore you guys either. But Now, some of them I have, the pot is as big as your table in front of you. You need a forklift to pick it up. And I knew that one I wasn't bringing, for sure. Uh, but these are medium-sized and smaller ones. This is just a, um, a pinwheel jasmine. Most people have them in their yards as shrubs and that kind of thing. I bought this at Peterson's Nursery over on the... Lakeland Highlands Boulevard in 548. I got that, I think, in uh, 2019 or so. And I've taken many cuttings off of it and air layers off and done different things. This is the model plant. But this style that you see here is a particular style of bonsai. So there's many different. There's This is called literati, where you've got this sort of, you know, maybe it's, it's, a, it's a feminine look, OK? So it's, it's got curves and twists, and, and it's elegant versus a more rugged, Marlboro man, kind of look with the big thick trunks. We'll have some of the trees that this uh, portion will carry a little more rugged, look, a little more sturdy. Um, so this is more elegant. That's a, just a pinwheel jasmine, and here's just a bougainvillea. I brought this one because someone asked me the other day, well, "What's your favorite plant?" And I was like, "Well, who's your favorite kid?" or something. Like that. That's hard to answer. But I would say if I had to, living here in Central Florida like we're doing, I only have one species of plant, or somehow required to have just one, I would go with bougainvilleas because they flower a lot. Um, this was yard waste. You know, there's yard waste everywhere. If people put them in the yard, they get too big, they don't like them, they cut them down, they throw them to the street. And you can go take like this. It's only been a couple of two, three days sitting in the pile, not six months, but a couple of days. You can just take a log that looks like it should go into the fireplace or something, soak in a bucket of water overnight, put it in soil, which is kind of what I did here, and then within two, three weeks, it's got little, little sprouts coming out oh there, putting out roots. So they're very rugged trees, and uh, and they come in so many different colors, too. I mean, there's orange, there's white, there's purple and pink and red, and it just goes on and on. So anyhow, that's a bougainvillea, and you can uh, go around on yard waste day with your car and look for the telltale bracts fall on over like I do have your trusty saw out and uh, I stopped gathering ones that are just straight sticks anymore because they're hard to do anything with and I have so many so now I only take ones that have interesting you know bends and curves in them or ones that have interesting bracts you know unusual colors you can do that without roots yeah so again if it's relatively fresh a day or two or three and it was a healthy tree to begin with. So when the landscape people come through your yard and they're saying, my bougainvillea is so big, please just chop it down to the, and they do, and they make a big pile. They can get out there with your little handsaw and start looking for good bends, you know, and then cut you a section. You don't have to have any leaves, any roots, anything. All the energy in a bougainvillea is in the, in the, in the bark. I want to go home and do that. <laughs> sure. And so my technique, and there's probably others if that work well too, but I soak it in a bucket of water overnight. Just throw it in a five gallon bucket of water, let it sit. I might drop in a little bit of Super Thrive or some vitamin, you know, some trick, but you don't have to, just water will work. And then uh, I put it in a good potting medium, not a, a good draining, not too mucky, because it'll, otherwise when the roots do start out, they'll root rot on you real fast. So it's got to still drain well, but not too fast. So there's a, you know, get an in-between, so a lot of perlite in a, in, in a mix will help you out. 
And uh, yeah, I uh, then I every morning I have my cup of coffee, walk out in the garden, I walk by all my logs there, looking to see that any of them have a leaf. When one pops out like a kid at Christmas, yeah, you know, it's it's doing its thing. It's gives me something to look forward to in the morning to see if they popped out. But um, one of my favorites, I just re repotted it yesterday for the first time in four years. So a lot of cuttings I got off of a neighbor's uh, yard up in the Cleveland Heights. It's just past the golf course, going up the hill from where I live. And I saw the pile, and I went back with my uh, saw, and I was getting some branches. And I noticed the stump was still on the ground. The stump was probably three quarters the size of this table. Had a bunch of branches coming up, kind of in a windswept way. But her landscape people had just cut it to about this high off the ground, so it was just a stump, just tr a trunk with stumps coming out. I'm like, hmm, I wonder if she wants that they're still in the ground. So I left her a note, and I came back the next day, rang the doorbell, said, hey, look, uh, I took a few of your branches, hope you don't mind, because they're out for yard waste. I said, who do you want to do with the stump? She says, oh, I want it out of here, but they wanted too much money, the landscape. I said, well, if you let me have it, I'll dig it out for you. So I came back with my shovel and my little sawzall, and I took my time, and I cut around, and I was able to get some roots, which is really good, and I got out, and I put it in a, uh, Mixing a bin that you can get at Lowe's or Mule for, for like mortar mix and, and concrete. It's a black tray about yay big. Filled it with soil, put some drainage holes in it, and I put it in there. And then uh, I didn't know what to put it on. I was throwing out an old wheelbarrow where the bucket had broken, and I put the tray on there, attached it to the wheelbarrow handles, and I put it out in the yard, and it took off. It And I get people stopping at the stop sign. They, how did you get your boogan Billy in that wheelbarrow? How does it do that? How does it blow? How does it keep blowing? Like, so my, one of my most favorite, you know, famous trees for neighbors that pass by I can all work. They want to know all about it is my wheelbarrow bougainvillea. It's a big stump, and it does. It, it just cascades red flowers right onto the ground. I trim it back up and I bring it all the way back. So I've grown all new branches on it from the stump. And what you do in bonsai is you grow them out and you push them back. And you grow them out. Each time the branches get a little thicker and a little thicker. And we're working on things like ramification. One branch into two. Goes into two more, goes into two more. So you go from one you know, to two to four to eight to 16 to 30. And it just keeps multiplying. And then you get that ramification. And as you push that back over the years go by, you end up with a tree that looks very aged. You know, it's got all the little twinkies out on the end. And uh, so again, Bougainvilleas, I would put at the top of my list. And that's why I brought that one to show you. So. Did that lady ever see the finished product? You know, she lives right up the road for me, so I imagine she did. But she never, I don't, she never stopped in and said anything. So maybe she wants it back. Right? <laughs> I won't answer the door, the doorbell. Right? Um, this tree I'd like to take credit for it is, is one I maintain for a friend. Uh, she's got a collection of, of trees. I've been shaping it a little bit and working on it. But the actual um, tree came from Weigert's uh, bonsai nursery down in North Fort Myers. And Eric Weigert is a Florida bonsai master. And, uh, he sells trees around the world and that type of thing. But this is a Portulacaria afra, a dwarf jade. And uh, you can get dwarf jades at just about anywhere and probably familiar with them. They're just succulents. But obviously this is an older one and it's been shaped in a uh, very um, correct, informal, upright bonsai style with the pads and the, and the twist and the trunk and that type of thing. So I brought this as an example of what, what would be called a specimen tree. When they reach this level, they're kind of maintaining they're there, they've arrived, they're rock stars. You just gotta keep them in their prime and looking good for as long as you can. Uh, these guys are more, you know, in various stages of becoming rock stars. And then, you know, some of your pre bonsai stuff is uh, just ready to begin their journey today. And they're diamonds in the rough, the beauty is in there somewhere, and our goal is to find it and help bring it out. Um, and so, you know, I said, well, my favorite species would be this. This would be one of the more expensive trees. Uh, and then there's something like this that um, to me is priceless. I've got three of them I consider priceless because they're sentiment. You know, it's like, oh, the guy's sentimental about his trees. You know, I know a little bit. But this particular is, a, this is an orange tree. And in 1995, so 29 years ago, uh, still on active duty in the Army, we were down visiting my mom and dad over in St. Petersburg, Florida. They had an orange tree in their back. So my kids were younger, and we grabbed a bunch of oranges off the tree. We took them back with us. We were stationed up near the Pentagon, then up in Virginia. And uh, my son in 95 would have been, oh, less than 10 years old. So uh, we ate the orange. We took the seeds, set them on the windowsill. We ended up planting them. We got a bunch of little orange trees. Well, this is one of them. So it's a 29-year-old orange tree. And as you know from orange trees, 
those leaves should be fairly large. It should be, you know, 15 to 25 feet tall. And, but um, the roots are all gnarly because, oh, I was not paying attention and was deployed doing stuff in a way, and it got root bound. And when I got home, I took it out of the pot and I couldn't straighten the roots out without killing the tree. So I said, I'm just going to own it and just raise it up and let the roots be. So it's sort of an unusual look for an orange tree to have all those exposed roots. But um, so yeah, so it's sentimental. And I have two others that very same year, 95. I got the orange seed. Uh, Mom and dad had a big laurel oak in the front yard. And you know, the little baby acorns, little baby uh, oaks are all over the grass, just mow over them. I plucked one out, the acorn was still attached to it. And now it's uh, about 18 inches high. It should be, what, 60 feet high, 29 years old. It has a trunk about yay big around, so it's very masculine looking, you know, thick trunk and then all the little branches out. And uh, that's a laurel oak that's the same age as this. And then the last one is from my grandparents' yard. It's a snow bush. Now, if you're familiar with snow bush, there's snow on the mountains. Some people call them Sabrenia distica. And uh, he had it as a hedge in front of his house, again, over in St. Petersburg. And, Visiting grandma and grandpa, and as I was walking out, I'm always looking at stuff, and I saw it had some root suckers coming up, and I pulled one, and the part of the root came with it, and I'm like, okay, got some root, got three or four leaves, stuck it in a Dixie cup, and uh, now it's a beautiful, twisted, drop over, kind of cascading looking, uh, which is not a, a, a common a bonsai material, but it, it's a very nice, we've got the round, uh, circle like leaves of different colors, like green and kind of a reddish and silver all kind of in there mixed together so, so that's my story on these trees here and how they oh and the last one's like okay so carolyn said about roses i'm like you know i shouldn't tell you this i've had a couple of roses over the last 40 years so i started bonsai 40 years ago after watching the karate kid wax on wax off mr yogi there's a bunch of us that got got the bug then i'm like oh, that doesn't look that hard he's growing them and and it was orange trees again. This is 1984. Sowed a bunch of them. Got a whole tray of little seedlings. They're six months old with probably 10, 12 leaves on them. And in this book, I don't know if you might remember this, before internet days, you use these things. They were called books. <laughs> and there was a company called Sunset. And it was Sunset. It would be how to cross stitch or how to you know, woodwork or how did this, this was how to bonsai and it was at Kmart, it was on sale for like a dollar. So I'm like, okay, so I got the book and in the book it tells you, look, if you want to have smaller leaves, when they got big leaves, just defoliate the tree and the next set of leaves that come out will be smaller because the energy is reduced. Great idea. So I took all my little six month old seedlings and cut all the leaves off them and they all died. <laughs> so there's fine print, very fine print or I can read it, it says, on a adult, mature, healthy, blah, 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 blah. So, uh, you know, you're talking about kill, who's saying they're killing trees? You're killing trees? Killing trees. There is an adage to be a bonsai master, you must kill 1,000 trees. I'm close. I'm close. <laughs> that photo album is against right. the law. A picture would be in the post office. Yeah, you'd be in the, the, the planet <laughs> post office <laughs> wanted. You know, I could do violence with my yeah. eyes closed. Kill them? No, no, she grows and grows like yeah. crazy. Though. Everyone's got a nemesis. Some people, yeah. it's the juniper. So there's a guy in our club says he walks by a juniper and dies. <laughs> <laughs> so we all have our nemesis and that type of thing. But yeah, I've got a, I've got a photo album. I keep track of. I got pictures of this guy when he was just, you know, all through the stages and that type of stuff. But if he were to go over the Rainbow Bridge for plants, <laughs> I would move his photos into my Trees That Used to Be Alive album, which is pretty. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I'm well on my way too. But yeah, the book kind of helped. So I'm going to do something you don't normally do when you're talking. Is I'm just going to ha hand out things for you to kind of look at and pass around. These are some just books that I would get on sale that have pictures in them. This is a guy named Peter Chan. He's over in England. He's got a YouTube channel. Oh, wow. He's quite elderly. Now, this is one of his books that he, he wrote. He's got some real pretty nice pictures in there of Bonsai. Just kind of pass them around and kind of look as you go. But you'll see that there's so many different varieties of plants that... Um, yeah, wherever you want to go, whether you want to mess with, uh, I've been okay. working on okay. Hawaiian Thai plants, you know, Dracaenas and Cordylines, something doing, them. They, they're very interesting. Um, so my neighbor had a big uh, Hawaiian Thai plant. The landscape people hit it with a lot more, broke a branch off. I grabbed the branch, stuck in the soil and root. All that's good. Now, I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna chunk chop it, let you know, new ones come up the side, which it did. 
And then I would chunk drop that in, and when new ones come up, and then they started sending roots down. Roots were coming down, mm -hmm. heading to the ground. And then I trunk chopped it. Then the plant says, well, wait, you don't need roots anymore. Send a change order to the roots to become branches. So it turned around and came back up and put leaves. I'm like, that's just amazing to watch what Mother Nature does. You know, mm -hmm. When it had a lot of foliage, it needed more roots. So it sent them to go down to the soil. Then I changed the situation, took all the foliage away, and it sent a change order. It's like the T cells or something. You can, they can be anything they need to be when the body needs it. So that's a little thing I discovered on, on Dracaena's coral lines, Hawaiian type lines. They're kind of fun looking. So um, I have a ponytail palm. I bought it in 2004 at Home Depot, or no, it would have been Walmart, for 1999, a little plastic bonsai pot. It was about yay tall. Now it's in a pot uh, half the size of this table, and it's got a trunk this big around. And one of the arms I was able to take, you know, normally they go kind of straight up, and then they have the long ponytail down. I got one that I was able to bend the arm around enough. It took three years because I put a cable on it with a turnbuckle. And every couple months I'd go out and give it two more turns and pull it. A couple months later, I'd give it two more turns and pull it. And so I finally got it to kind of do kind of a bending and turn up. Unusual things to play with. So, But when it comes to roses, yeah, I had a couple and I killed them. And uh, roses um, have minds of their own. It appeared to me as I was working, they kind of had minds of their own. And just as I found with uh, camellias, uh, roses, um, orchids, there are groups of folks that can tell you a lot about them. And that's why when we get our, so this, this here is a little package of examples of all the different things that can go in the soil um, yeah, uh, that you can kind of look at and see how it works. So we use a mixture of all this, charcoal and all that. So you Feel free to pass those around and look at them and kind of get a feel. But they're really just, they have different purposes. So some of the, uh, the pumice, the clay, will have a water absorption capability and then a, a release capability to put it back out to the plant when they need it. Some of it is just to have the water pass through quickly. And then the organic stuff, of course, is providing some nutrients as well as holding some moisture. So, so the soil piece is important. And like I told you, one of the... Uh, most challenging parts of bonsai is the watering piece. And um, if you have really good bonsai soil, your life is so much easier. You can grow a plant in garbage soil, muck, sand, but you better know what you're doing in terms of fertilizing and watering and all that. You can do it, but you gotta be a PhD at it. If you're just a regular Joe, and you're trying to figure your way out and you don't wanna put years and years into a plant just to make a mistake one day and kill it with overwatering and underwatering, uh, then get the best bonsai soil that you can possibly either get or build because what it's doing is it makes overwatering almost impossible. I tell people you'd have to stand there with a garden hose to overwater the bonsai trees. You have to stand there for hours and hours, days and days to kill it by overwatering. That's how good the soil is. Now you can still kill it by underwatering pretty quickly here in Florida in August, you know. Why is it so high? Uh, different plants like different, so if I'm using uh, azaleas or uh, blueberries, blueberries love acidic soil, then I'll add more of that to it. So we know what the pH level of each of the ingredients are so we can theoretically adjust. I use this thing called universal soil. So it's, it's good for 95% of the plants just as is. I'll add a soil acidifier if it's a soil acid loving plant and I will you know, tone it down, make it a little alkaline so it's an alkaline loving plant. <coughs> yes. I have a question. Sure, please ask away. Are your children as excited about bonsai as you? <laughs> Nobody is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the longest time, my wife says, look, you can go in Home Depot or Lowe's, but you can't go into the garden department. <laughs> 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 this is not going to be allowed. I'm going to grab a chair over here if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, my, so when I was on active duty in the Army, um, I always had five to maybe 25 trees, because I was moving every 18 months or so. And then they all ship your trees, like you know, a lot of other stuff. So we'd always get a little U-Haul trailer or something. And every time we stop at a rest area, the kids and Karen go to the bathroom, and I'd be out there with my spray bottle, you know, spraying down the plants and stuff. And then, oh, thank you. And then I'd go, um, I had to go overseas a couple of times, uh, and I knew I was going to be gone for a year. Um, this was back during the Iraq time and all that. I was in Iraq, so 
Um, I had maybe 20 plants or so, so I took five to my mom and dad's house, five to my sister's house, five to Karen's, my, my wife's mom's house, and a couple of them I planted in, in the yard for them. All they had to do is have the sprinkler system on it. You know, I told them, look, don't, don't sweat it. If they make it, they make it. If they don't, they don't. And almost all, a few of them didn't, didn't do well, but most of them did. But it, so my collection was small. And once I retired, uh, and we weren't moving anymore, it was like, game on. <laughs> yeah. No, my, my kids don't. Uh, they're, they're, they're growing and growing. They're in their 40s, and they're out there doing their thing. And um, yeah, everyone has the biggest interest in it. But we try to balance it with other things as well. So what are we working on here? What's the tree? What's the plant? The Marcus Vineyard. Marcus Vineyard. My glasses on. Oh, yeah, there's the tree. <laughs> so. so, how, Jan, Don, how big would this normally get? This particular one? Not big. Not that big? So, I see the leaves are small, and uh, as with the case with most. Things you want to bonsai are like ideally you choose a plant that's got small naturally small leaves anyway, you know, uh cerissa plants and uh Yopon hollies and things like that. A lot of small leaves. Now I have a I have a sea grape. You, know, you know what the sea grape is, right? They get a dinner plate size leaves. Well, there's a technique for making smaller leaves, and I told you one of them I tried on my orange trees and killed them all. But if you do it right, there's a technique. And so my sea grape right now, which I bought at the greenhouse back when Jarman was the, running it back in the, oh, gee, 2010, I guess it would have been. And uh, it's a bonsai from him. And those leaves are probably silver dollar size. You know? Wow. So it's, that's a, but if it's a flowering or fruiting plant, like that orange tree, it hasn't, it hasn't had fruit on it. It didn't have flowers many years ago. It hasn't flowered down a very long time. I'm using pruning it. Yes, but if it were to get an orange, it would be a full-size orange. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Same with apple trees. People will bonsai an apple tree, and a cute little apple tree and have a big Macintosh apple on it, which ruins the scale concept, right? This idea of scale. But at the same time, from a curiosity standpoint, it's an eye catcher, and it's kind of cute in its ugliness, if you will. Yeah. Weird to describe. You know what I'm kind of saying on that. So, um, so yeah. So if you're going to have a flower plant or a fruiting plant and you want to stay within scale for the bonsai purposes, then you would try to pick a variety. All right, if I cut your pot down to you, I don't mind. I don't it's, your, it's yours now. I don't want to. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, the flower, it, on some varieties, I assume, of roses are larger, and on some varieties of roses and cultivars are smaller, right? So um, if you wanted to stay and that idea of having good scale and seeing what you need to see. I can really make a mess, you know. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Really Is there a can there? Yeah. Yeah. For the house? Yeah. Yeah, you can't, you cannot reduce the size of the flower and the fruit. And the leaves you can do. Leaves you can do. And obviously the trunk can, and all that, you can you can work on what you want the size of that to be over time. You can scale it down and all that. So, um, on my bougainvilleas, what I'll do is, if I'm going to be doing a lot of wiring of branches, and I'll talk about that here in a minute when we're doing wiring, but um, I will go through and Remove the thorns from the boogies because you get the boogie bites. You know, where you, uh, you wonder how much blood can I actually lose before I do pass out? Because they'll get you, they'll bite you. Um, yeah, and once you cut, the, I mean, you probably already know this from your roses, if you cut the thorns off, they don't grow back, not on that same branch. Now, a new branch will have them, but the old branches. Um, so when I'm working with nursery stock, like if I go to the Lowe's or Home Depot when I'm allowed to, and um, you know I'm going to get a juniper, I'll be down there on my hands and knees going through that table and, and rubbing the dirt back, looking at the trunk, digging down, and trying to figure out if it's got an interesting trunk line or not. 
versus the guy that's there for you know putting in his shrubs for the weekend. He comes up with a flat cart and grabs seven trees and puts it on there and just goes. You know, I'm in here going like this, and back in and working. Well, that's that weird guy back in there looking at plants. But I can always tell a fellow bonsai artist doing the same thing, going in there and looking. So I went actually to Lowe's, I guess it was last week, and I said, well, I'm going to have to have a little rose to show everybody. So I picked this one out. It was a, uh, and I didn't bring the little tag that was on. I know it's a, it's a white, an iceberg something, and, um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a modern rose, so it's a shrub type. It's a ground covering type. It's an iceberg, the yeah, iceberg, yeah. And, but it was in the pot up to here, and I thought I was getting three little trees because I was going yeah. to make three little trees for, or some trees for your raffle or whatever you're going to have. So I got there and I started raking the soil away and started getting down further and realizing we're not separate trees. And when I finally got down to where there was an interesting trunk line, I saw that it was actually one tree with three, but it was buried in, in soil all the way up to here. You know how they do it in nursery, they just sink the tree down in there. So, um, so if I do buy nursery stock, it is always a little surprise when you do get on the rake away the soil. So what I've just done is I've lowered the, the, the uh, pot a little bit so I can rake it away and see if we're anywhere near. And we won't spend too much time on this today because, uh, well, it takes a lot of time. But we'll at least get started on it. And then uh, there's not a big rush to move this to bonsai pot, but we can could do it now, we could also do it in the near future. It doesn't have to be a finished pot, they come in various training. I just brought these as little examples. They don't have to be expensive, they can be inexpensive. These are just plastic, rigging made, bonsai shaped training pots. And they already have the screens in the bottom and all that so makes life easy. You can also do them in different shapes, different sizes. Uh, these hex hexagonal shape pots. I, I always keep a supply of all different sizes of them. You never know when I'm going to need one. But they're relatively inexpensive. And then as the tree matures, it becomes more valuable or sentimental, you can move up to a more expensive pot. You get very expensive pots. Yeah, you can. So I was at the Wyatt's Bonsai Nursery a couple of weeks ago. He's got a large selection of pots. The most expensive pot I saw there was $7,000. Oh, wow. That's just a pot, no tree, no nothing. <laughs> And um, there are quite a few that were 1500 2000 Some of them were those little bitty little ones that sit in the palm of your hand. Uh, the $900, oh, but they're oh, hand painted by Mr. So and so, such and such, and Tokenama, Japan, this or that. I'm like, I don't know that person. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 don't, I don't have any of those pots myself. But they do exist. And. Um, the other thing, because it is such an old art form, it goes back to well, there's there are collectors that have some from the Tang Dynasty, 600 wow. to 900 AD bonsai pots. Now that's an antique, and, you know, and they're priceless. You know, they're kind of things that I guess Bill Gates can buy or something. So, so this is just a root rake, and I'm just pulling back the soil. What I'm doing is I'm pulling it radial from the base. So if I break any roots, I'm breaking the crossing ones, not the the radial ones. Because you want your tree to have these radial roots that come out from the base and, and go out and give the tree a powerful look coming out of the soil. So I'm just going to stop it right there. We'll move up to branch selection. So it's right now. Yes, it is. It's got a nice shape. I'm going to get out here so we can see what So one of the concepts is you've got to kind of start your journey. And that's what this tree is starting now. It's starting its journey down the bonsai path. And um, this is where it really gets my wife. Says, what is wrong with you? Because I'll sit there for, for a long time just staring at this thing. You know? I'll have a cup of coffee, I'll have a Coca-Cola, I have a beer, there's a mood I'm in. And uh, I just kind of get inspired. But what we're looking for, the first thing we're looking for is what the front of the tree. Most of our tree compositions have a front. And we'll do our pruning based on where we think the front is. And the decision making starts at the roots. I'll look at the roots and see which way the roots come out. And I think that'll be the first. Next to be trunk movement. So this, as you might be able to see from the way back there, see how the, the tree comes out and kind of goes off to my left, your right. With a kind of a swoop off this way. If I turn it right at you, you'll lose that shape. Now it's just kind of going straight up. So I know right coming out of the gate, that's either the front 
or 180, or that's the front. One of these two has got to be the front, and then we'll make that kind of decision. So I, not, I could go either way, but what we don't want to have is an eye poker, one that's the front coming right at you. If I turn it this way, we've got an eye poker. It's this one right here. can remove it. That's an easy fix. But if I turn it this way, this becomes a back branch, which gives depth to the tree. So I think all else being the same, we'll kind of start that way. So I'll turn it towards me a little bit so I can kind of see. So once we kind of decided where our front is, and uh, like I'm using right here is just a guide wire. You can also pull a tree down. Some people will tie it to the pot or to a root or something else and just use a guide wire. Now, but you're going to add the movement that you want in the tree, either through wire or by, by pruning, clip and grow method, or um, guide wires and things like that. So, all right. Still having my second and third thoughts. Um, another decision that needs to be made fairly early is how big of a tree do you want? So we wanted this to be uh, a three foot tall or four foot tall larger bonsai, then I probably just go put it back out in the garden, right? I'll clip a few of the branches off and this, it needs to grow up. Um, if we wanted to stay small, we probably missed the boat on the little bean size one. That might be a clipping from it later on. But uh, if we wanted to use a little very, very small, uh, six inches or smaller, or we could go medium size. So kind of get an idea where you think you want the top of the tree. We'll kind of go for a larger, small, or a smaller, medium kind of size. And then uh, begin uh, cleaning it out. So obviously any dead branches need to come out. Uh, what we're trying to avoid is long stretches of nothing, uh, straight, long inner nodes. Um, that all needs to go away. Branches that cross each other are usually a pretty good no-no. But I think go real small. Your, your plan. <laughs> keep it. Oh, I, oh you, I'm going to keep it? Yeah. Oh, well, then I don't want to mess it up. No, it's not. <laughs> it was yours. I know. It's like, I'm going to put away on somebody else's tree all day long. We don't care what you do with it. That's it. Oh, well, you got to think I'm crazy, but I'm thinking of keeping it very small, so I'm going to take make a big cut. Because when you make a big cut, you kind of go in. Now tell me about roses. Do you guys leave die back when you make a cut? Do you go a little further away, leave a little stump for a while, and then die back, and then clean it up later? Is that a technique you use in your pruning, or are you just go in there and snip some stuff? Yeah. So if you cut a branch on a, on a rose right up against trunk or, or right by another branch, it usually doesn't die back and kill that branch as well. Is your been your experience? You have to be careful certain times of the year uh, of normal. Get in there. Get in there. Yeah. So you want to seal that. You do seal it. Yeah. No, it's dependent upon the time of the year. Okay. What time of year is this? Um, Bad time. Bad time. So seal it. Bad time. No, seal it. Seal them up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're going to take a big cut. I'm going to leave a little stump there for now just to be safe so that it doesn't go back and kill me when I want. So one, two, three, go. Get out of here. Goodbye. Small one. Right, this is going to be our main branch right here. We're going to wire that up. Now, if we were to cut along one of the branches, typically we would go just above a leaf set. Okay, got it. Yes. Um, and that I think is true for an awful lot of variety of plants. If you leave a leaf set, now some uh, you can take them all the way down to nothing. They just bounce back. It's a lot of dormant buds in there that get activated right away, but there's others that kills it. There's nothing to pull the nothing to pull the energy up from the roots anymore, and the plant just says, well, I'm out of here. Typically, the larger the diameter, the more dormant buds you'll find they're there. Okay. What did you put on the card? Uh, it's all written in Japanese, so I couldn't tell you anything <laughs> about it. Uh, it smells good, and I've been told from people that do read it that it's got a um, Antifungal in it as well, so it seals and it's got an antifungal in it. So it's a it's a cut paste. Or Elmer's glue. Elmer's glue. There's a lot of guys in our group that do use Elmer's glue. 
I actually have the official got all written in Japanese on it, so it's got to be good. Yeah, Elmer's glue. Yeah, Elmer's glue and a seal. Yeah, some people will use that. Yeah, yeah, that won't help you out too much. With it. Okay. All right, now we've made that decision that we've taken off that big branch. We know we're going to work with this. We've got two big back ones here going in the different directions. So I think we're going to go ahead and remove this big guy. We're too close to it. One other thing you don't want to usually have is two branches coming out from the same spot on a trunk. Oh. So if you have two branches coming out from the same spot on the trunk, you'll end up with a, uh, or a whirl where branches are coming out in all directions. You'll end up with a, a bulge at that point. It'll create what's called inverse reverse taper. So you, what you want on a tree normally is taper. Thicker trunk down at the bottom and as it goes upwards it gets thinner and thinner all the way out to the itty bitties, right? But if a tree comes up and it's going skinny, all of a sudden it gets fat again and goes skinny, it, it, it throws off the idea of the scale that you want. So, so, so you'll get that swelling on the trunk if you've got too many uh, branches coming out of one spot. So down to just one. And um, that should get us going there. Uh, some trees, like bald cypress, you don't cut on those until they're totally dormant in the winter. They'll bleed out on you any other time. You just, yeah, so if you've got bald cypress and you're trying to bald them, you're making cuts. Your most, your best time to do that is when they're totally dormant in December, January, and get them before they come back out again. I'm actually going to remove a couple of these stickers here before they get me. The one I don't get will be the one that gets me. Okay. Not as small as that one. Yeah, yeah, they not as small. They won't reach you there. So we have different gauges of wire. It takes a little while to figure out what you want for the right gauge. If you go too thin, you put it on there, bend the branch, and it goes right back. If you put it on too thick, you risk breaking the branches, and you can't you can't get the movement in there that you want. Out of it. So, um, cascade. So I told you there's a bunch of styles. That's literati. Formal upright, informal upright. There's cascade where the plant sort of water falls out of the pot. A full cascaded water falls out of the pot even below the level of the pot. So you have to have the pot on the stand or something. In semi cascade, it flows out of the pot and it stops before it gets to the bottom of the pot and sweeps out. And stuff. So, um, What was the name of that nursery or, or the person that had it in, 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 in Tampa? No, oh, Tampa is Artisans, A-R-T-I-S-A-N-S, -S, Artisans, and it's on uh, an I-75 Fletcher Avenue. It's right there, maybe a half a mile off of there. So what in Fletcher? Uh, I-75, the interstate. Oh, okay, Fletcher. In Fletcher. Yeah, I think I know it is. Yeah, it's maybe a half a mile And what was that person's name? That? Joe Kane is the owner of Artisan. Mm -hmm. so, so, and so I tell people, Artisan is a very nice nursery. It's very close. It's, it's in, you never say, the Noted Assassin or yeah. Ronald Assassin. Assassin. That, that one. You got the, you're saying it on the wrong syllable. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good, it's a very good nursery. He's a great guy. He's got a very nice selection of trees. But if that's, like, Weigert's is like the Disneyland of bonsai, and then Joe Kane's Artisans here in Tampa would be kind of like a big county fair, you know, very nice. The Disney World one, the Universal Studios one is Weigert's, and then North Fort Myers is two hours away. You can take all back. How do you spell that? W-I-G-E-R-T-S. G-E-R? G-E-R-T, apostrophe S. Weigert's Oh, okay, in Fort Myers. It's in Fort North Fort Myers, and if nothing else, look him up and look at his website. He's got all, a lot of his trees on there. If you go to his specimen trees, you'll see them, and they range from, well, the most expensive one I saw was 45000 Oh, my. Whoa. Uh, he's got a whole slew of them in the twenty thirty thousand range. There's a whole bunch of them in the four five six thousand dollars range. So they're, they're gorgeous trees. And, but even if you just go to Logan, he's got a beautiful koi pond. All his trees are beautifully uh, presented in a nice Japanese garden environment. You can walk around. They're very friendly people. They have a lot of workers. They're all friendly. All the other. Now they have 
gift tree, you know, starter trees too. You can get a 35, a beautiful 35 to 55 dollar bonds if you need to give a housewarming gift to somebody instead of cut flowers. He's got beautiful trees. They all aren't 45,000. He's got everything from say 25, 35 dollars all the way up to 45,000 or in between. He's got a beautiful koi pond and nice little area you can sit in the shade and just enjoy the beauty of the area. So, so I, I highly recommend it. And then he's one of the masters in, okay. in, the, in the trade here. <coughs> Joe Kane with a K or a C A I N. Joe Kane owns and runs uh, Artisan's Bonsai Nursery, which okay. is right here. Yeah, in right. Tampa. But the, that would be a nice day trip to go to Fort Myers. Yeah, oh, that's what we did with our whole group, and we actually packed a little uh, sack lunch because by the koi pond they've got some chairs, some benches, and we even brought some folding chairs and just sat there, listened to the waterfall, looked at the beautiful bonsai trees, and ate our peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> it was a nice, it was a nice day. We all had a good time. And the other, and the third nursery I'd recommend to you, to you is D and L, D and L uh, nursery. It's in the Ocala National Forest, so it's north of here, two hours. So Weigert's is two hours south, D and L is two hours north, and it's right in the middle of the National Forest. It's like secluded. On uh, May, I think it's the 11th, but it's Saturday in, uh, in May, I think it's the 11th, is uh, National World Bonsai Day. And he celebrates it every year by having like a big, he brings in uh, guest artists, they have vendors there selling wares, uh, they do demonstrations, they have raffles. This year they're raising the money for uh, Alzheimer's, so they, they all the proceeds go to charity. Last year was a, a child's uh, uh, children, this year is for our Alzheimer's. And uh, you know, it's just a fun, relaxed, they have a big pot, uh, not pot left, but a, I think it's like maybe five dollars, and they put out a spread and just go through the line of baked beans and casseroles, and it's like a big family picnic. If you look that one up, DNL will be on his website. He'll tell you more about it. It's like May 11th, and you'll get, get to see a lot of uh, a lot of nice stuff. So, David, the yes. rose you're working on uh -huh. does cascade. Naturally. Oh, good. So just for let you know, I just got one from Jen and. It's cascading in the pot. All right. Mm -hmm. Good. Just for your information. Well, then we're off to it. We're going to be doing, you know, so I was took my first bald cypress several years ago. You know, bald cypresses like to grow straight up, right? I said, oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to, and I wrapped it with raffia, and I wrapped it with electrical tape, and I wrapped it with big, uh, thick wire, and I bent that thing in half. And my, my vision was to have this tree come up, come down, cascade, and then have it make all of its branches down low. And so the tree's like, oh no you don't. So it starts sending up new shoots right at the bend, right? Well, I clip them off. And she's like, no. And it sends up more, it wouldn't do anything down there. So I have these conversations with the trees. You know, the little negotiation a little bit. I say yes, they say no, I say maybe, they say, well I'll think about it and we come to a compromise. You know, but if you have the tree do what it wants to do naturally, and you're working together on it, you're gonna say, okay, all right, you want to cascade? I'll help you cascade, but we're gonna do it this way. I want you to come, you know. And he's like, okay, I can do that. So if you make a tree do something it doesn't want to naturally do, you gotta fight on your hand. You might win, you might not win, but it's it's it's, uh, it's fun. When she sat that one, the first thing she said, but mine's cascading. Mine's cascading. No, this is just a <laughs> Well, so now I'm gonna take this wire I'm going to kind of bring it down into the soil to anchor it a little bit and then kind of start coming around the trunk to get a good anchor on it. And then we'll work our way up to the branch that we want to go around, which is going to be our cascading branch. Let's see. So what did you do in the Army? I was a military police officer for the first 20 years and then the last 10 years it moved me into a very exciting career field where I was basically a city manager for army bases. So my last assignment was at Fort Drum, New York, which if you don't know where that is, the next exit out on the interstate after us was Canada. <laughs> so there's a Florida boy up there saying, oh, come on. You were outside of Antwerp, New York. Yeah, yeah, Antwerp. That's I remember <laughs> that as a going to visit my grandfather pharmacy in Antwerp. And in the morning, I would listen to the Howard series going on on 
Well, sure, yeah, that was our howitzers. And then as the city manager, I'd start getting phone calls from neighbors. Why are all those noises going off in the middle of the night? I'm like, come on, you're in your army days. You know, <laughs> yes. So, and I did that, you know, for a number of years. And we, we really liked them. The people were friendly. It's very rural up there. And, uh, right. uh, yeah, a lot of farmers and uh, used to be uh, paper mills and stuff, mill workers. And people were just talking about southern hospitality. I think it's more rural hospitality. People, we, we thought we were like, the first time we, you know, went in to, uh, you know, get some help in the store. People were like, talking to you, how's your day? You know, it was, it was just, we thought we were in a movie or something. It's like, this is, are you guys with the Chamber of Commerce? Or is, this a, is this a setup? Or, but uh, we enjoyed it there. But the snow just got to be too much for me after a while. That's why we're here. Yeah. yeah. And my wife's a native Floridian. She was born and raised in St. Pete. I was a transplant. 70s. I came down with my family. I was, I was a teenager from Connecticut. What part? Uh, Connecticut, Windsor, Windsor Locks. Enfield. My brother lives there now. My brother's yeah. back in Enfield. Yeah. Well, he was in Summers, but now he's in Enfield. Yeah. Yeah. Enfield. Yeah. That's yeah. where I'm going to so watch. Watch Top Mountain or Watch Top Hill or something. It's a new new development in Quinn. So where he moved from Summers back over there. Yeah. Hazardville is right next to Summers. Yep, and Hazardville, my little league team used to play, our Windsor Locks team, we had to play Hazardville in the, in the championship when we lost. Hazardville was, now get yeah, back in the center. Yeah, right, exactly. But, um, yeah, Fort Drum gets a lot of snow, so I had that laurel, well, I had the, had the orange tree, of course, I had the laurel oak, so I went to work one day in 2006 or seven, and it was, October and it was a nice day out and I had my trees in the backyard. I went to work and I'm at eating my lunch at my desk and I look out the window and it's snowing. And I'm like, oh, come on, it's October. Oh my God, my trees are outside. So I go zipping home at lunchtime and I got a picture of it in my phone. If we get a chance later, I'll show you. Here's my laurel oak, you know, a Florida tree full of leaves covered in snow. And I'm like, this tree is not going to, it did fine. It did um, And then when I lived, um, you know, the rest of the time we were up there, I just learned I would bring it in the fall into my unheated garage, maybe in the 40s or 50s, but it, it, it lost a lot of its leaves, more like an oak wood. It didn't keep as many green leaves. It went dormant, and then it popped right back in the spring, so it, it adjusted. But uh, being in the military, moving around, it was tough on my trees. But a lot of the ones that are in my used to be alive book, you know, yeah, me, I was a knucklehead, did something wrong, but in some cases, you know, when you move from Georgia, then out to Kansas, and then Kansas to, you know, Virginia, and then Virginia down to Florida, and then up to New York. It's hard enough on us people, but a tree, it barely got acclimated to its last location, and now you're doing this to it again, so. Um, so it was interesting. But I did get to meet some other interesting people over the years when I was stationed in the Netherlands. Um, they had a visiting bonsai artist from Europe, and I remember his name, fairly early in kind of doing this and was still a little unsure of myself and I brought him a tree to work on and you know me I'll sit there with my scissors and say hmm so I take that one off here maybe there and then he goes slip 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 here you go and he was done I was like oh that was nice it looks good so like anything else I guess if you do it a lot and for a long time or well maybe it's just because it wasn't his tree like I was saying you know just go at it. So, um, you know, it's, it's also interesting to do these bending. I bent a, uh, a juniper that I had. It was a picture of a cascade where it had foliage on the top, and then it had foliage in the middle, and then it went over the pot, and there was another pad down low. Well, for whatever reason, the pad in the middle died after many years. So I had a pad up here, pad down here, and nothing in the top. This just looks weird. So it came to me that I could wrap that lower branch split it, so all these techniques I'll show you some other time. But anyway, wrapped it and I bent that way down here, right back up to the top again, twisted that thing, and you could hear snap, crack, so the wood's breaking. But on a juniper, if you keep that cambium, or at least a vein of that cambium intact, the tree will, will continue to thrive. So you can break the wood, you can break some of the cambium, you can tear it, but if you keep one line where it can get a lifeline back down to the roots, 
And that's how in nature you'll see them with dead wood all wrapped up in there and everything. They're all gnarled together and you know have all this life up top. And you're like, how? Well, because there is a vein, there is a highway of nutrients that it can make its way down. But when you're making those beds and you hear those things break, it's like bones break. You're like, it, it chills you. You're like, oh gosh, I'm killing this thing. But, um, but it's fine. What is your watering system now at the moment? Yes. So, um, I have developed a couple of things going because we have an RV and we like to travel. So I'm like, okay, how do you do that? So I've got a drip irrigation system uh, with the little emitters that go you know, right to each plant. And I've got that on three different timers, three different sources of water. So if one of them were to fail, there's a couple of others. And then I've got an overhead system that comes through regular PVC pipe with uh, misters that you put on the end of your uh, Normal, normal yard sprinkler kind of thing. So I've got some automated sprinkler. I don't use that normally when I'm home. I have it on this afternoon since I'm here. But when I'm home, I prefer to hand water because it does a couple of things. One is I can con precisely control the water I put on. Two is I collect rainwater in rain barrels, and I prefer to use that. Not that you know the plant will die because I use tap water. I'm very good to like to use it. And so I use my rainwater from the rain barrels that I have. And the most important thing is it makes me put my eyes on my plants daily because I'm looking for aphids, I'm looking for thrips, I'm looking for caterpillars. I'm, you know, you're looking for all those bad guys out there that'll get you overnight. Then I'm looking for, I put wire on this branch. You know, it's okay, but eventually this tree's gonna grow and it's gonna grow into that wire. And if I don't get it off in time, it'll scar the tissue of the branch, right? <laughs> Well, on a Marlboro man, rawr, 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 juniper, no problem. Scarring is good. On a more feminine, delicate, trident maple, elm tree with smooth bark, and you got you know, scars on it, it kind of ruins the beauty. So you got to kind of, so I walk through the garden in the morning, I'm watering, I'm looking, and uh, trying to catch them before they start scarring any of the, uh, Some of them in the shade, some of them in the sun. Yes, and, um, and that's changing, of course, as the seasons are going along with my junipers, my bougainvilleas, um, my desert roses. You know, desert roses, they're fun to play with, too. The huh? adenium desert roses. Really? Well, I was going to bring one today, but it was too big, and I've got room, and I thought, I don't know how much room we have here. But I've got a couple of them that are just beautiful. That's a fun one to play with, desert roses. Does anybody have deniums, desert roses? I had one when we lived in the They're beautiful, yeah. and they bloom nicely, and they come in different colors. That one has a black, black tone, or it's got black roses. Right? Where we are. Oh, yeah, you got to be careful with that. They're full of water. Um, to get them to get a lot of roots, have you, when I first saw this in Daytona, I thought you were nuts. So you starve it of water for a while, dry it out. Take it out of the soil laying there in front of you. And then you take a serrated kitchen knife. You take it from your kitchen drawer. Don't tell your wife, because I got in trouble for this one. I took a serrated kitchen knife and cut right through it like a potato. Cut that thing right in half. Then I would take this desert rose that I just cut in half, the, the, the caudex, right? Then I hang it in the shed, in the shade, hanging from a coat hanger for two weeks. It's like, you're torturing this plant, you know? It's just hanging there so that what your cut would, would dry up and heal. And uh, once that's dried up, then I plate, I took a, like, almost like a dinner plate underneath of it, put it underneath of it, and set it back in the soil. So the new roots that came out had to go out, they couldn't go down. So now the tree's putting out new roots, no water yet, no water until I start seeing new little wood and leaf. And when there's a little bit of leaf on there, it's like, it's like a horror movie, you know, plants. If they were to watch that, it would be like watching uh, Friday the 13th or you know, yeah, Jason the uh, hockey mask on or whatever. But this this guy. <laughs> but it, it makes for a, a beautiful, now I've got this very thick, oh, so you've starved it of water for over a month now. You just probably start, and it's starting to shrivel up a little bit. You just probably start, um, Watering it, I think the plant says, okay, you're never going to do this to me again. It soaks up that water and it just balloons right out again. It's like it's going to have extra on hand now because fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, you know, that thing. So he, uh, 
it, they, this, they fatten up real fat, and these root systems that come out from it are just very interesting, versus just leaving it to do its natural kind of thing, which is interesting enough. But, but that's how you bonsai it. And then to wire the branches to make bends and twists and interesting things, also you starve it a little bit because when it doesn't have as much water and it gets a little limpy, like most plants do, they get a little limpy when they're, when they're dry. That's the time to bend your desert rose without breaking the branches. And it's full of water, and you try breaking, you may snap a branch. So just if you want to play with desert roses, that's the that's the technique you want to kind of waste start. It's no wonder your wife is not good at the garden department. <laughs> Pardon? It's no wonder she gets not you go to the garden department. Yeah, no, it's uh, I was <laughs> off limits that. How often do you repot or change the soil? Yeah, so I'd say on average, an average one is every other year. Some of your younger tropicals, every year. And then some of your more aged plants, the longer they've been in the pot, the older they get, much like us humans, uh, we slow down a lot. Our growing habits slow down. So an older, refined tree, that oak tree that I have that's 30 years old, slowing down, I may not repot it once every 10 years. But I will change the soil mixture at that point. That soil that I sit around with you had some organic stuff in there, pine bark. The soil mixture I would use on my more finished tree is all inorganic. Nothing organic. So I have to fertilize it to feed it. Because the trouble with the organic stuff is it breaks down over time. And if I have organic in there and I don't need to repot the tree for 10 years, I'll have to repot it because the soil will have become more compact. It won't be draining the way it should because the organics have decayed and broken down. So on a finished tree, a more senior tree, a tree that's already reached its growth, does, I don't need to grow a lot more branches, I don't want to grow a lot, I want to slow it down and enjoy it, um, then I would use inorganic soil. As an average for your, answering your question is once every two years. That's why I said this year I got about 100 of them to do, and uh, some of them were rather large. How well did they take it up to the field with Yeah, and, uh, Talk, we're talking about timing, right? Timing is everything. So uh, the conifers and junipers, uh, while they're still dormant, just before they come out of dormancy, the ideal time. Your uh, deciduous trees that have dropped their leaves, the best time to do them is right as that bud is swelling but hasn't broken yet. That's the best time to do it. Your chances of success are significantly enhanced. I have some tropicals like my buttonwood, if you're familiar with a buttonwood, it's kind of like a mangrove here in Florida, but it's fresh water versus solar. A buttonwood is a very tropical tree, it grows down in the Everglades kind of thing. I won't repot that one until the night temperatures at night are no lower than the low 70s. So it'll be June or July before I repot that one. So every tree's got its window of ideal time. And if you got to, like I had to do some of them this year outside your window, but now I have to protect them. So I have to bring them in at night, or I gotta you know, watch if the temperature's gonna drop down one night into the 50s. There's a few trees I've recently repotted that I'll have to have to go grab and bring in. So, yeah, it was cool this morning, I thought. So, um, so I don't want to hold you guys up too long, but what I'll do here is I'll keep working on this. Any questions you have, keep fire them that way. If you got a good business, you gotta do what I want to do is I'm not our business. Okay, good. You guys are going to yeah, we got um, the cookies and raffles. So. You go grab your cookies. You can even do raffles. I was going to pass around. These are my business cards. I don't have a business. No, this is my hobby cards. But my name is on there, my telephone number, there's an email address. <laughs> you can text me. We have a little group. We call ourselves Sonbei, S-U-N-B-A. It's a, it's a Korean term. It's mainly a term of respect, of honor, of accept, appreciating the experience other people have. Soon Bay Bonsai. Uh, you mentioned Cypress Lakes Bonsai Club, the, the Yankee Lakelanders that live on the north side, you know, the northern lake. I hardly understand a word they say, it's that northern <laughs> accent. But us southern Lakelanders on this side of town, so there's a lot of people on this side that was made. So I said, let's start our own little group down here. We get together at least once, if not twice a month, informally. There are no dues, there's no Rogers rules, none of that. It's just it's just we just get together with plant geeks and we talk plants and uh, you're welcome to join us if you want to uh, follow on the Facebook I'll put on I'll advertise like when we're getting our next get together with just take a card or pass it back 
just send me a text or an email if you want to be on the mailing list. And, uh, and uh, if you're on the mailing list and then if you don't want to be on it, just send me another one. Say, hey, take me off your mailing list. It's that easy. But uh, we go on road trips sometimes like that while we went to Heathcote Gardens, which is over at uh, Fort Pierce area. They're over that way. Highly recommend it. There's a collection there from a gentleman that he willed his collection. Jim Smith was a Florida bonsai pioneer from the 60s, 70s. Well, his collection is there now being maintained at this botanical garden in Fort Pierce. And it's a small fee to get in. I think donation, but it is a full of, full of these and biggers of these just all over the place. So highly recommend that to you. Oh, Martha's been here. Do you want your chair back here? No, we're, 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 we're working on it. So. Yeah, I'll thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all right. Well, then we get this guy kind of started. Do some more wiring there. And uh, I'll move it to a cascade pot.